right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. This is our final faculty lecture of the fall semester, but we have three great ones coming up in the spring. Um, more details coming. So I'm honored to introduce our speaker today, Don King, who has taught communication studies here at Pellissippi State for 24 years. Before that, he taught at Murray State University and the University of Tennessee. He also worked as a delivery truck driver, a minister, a newspaper reporter, an editor, a freelance writer, an advertising professional, a professional speaker, and a radio DJ. Everything he has done professionally has involved communications in some way. Today, he's not sure if he's interested in human connections because he has studied them so much, or if he's studied them so much because he's so interested in human connections. But in any case, current events and current technology make him wonder, worry, and hope for our abilities to manage the dance of solitude and connection on the tech frontier. And again, it is my honor um, to introduce to you Professor Don King. Please help me to welcome him. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you. It's kind of weird to be anywhere for 24 years before I went into academics, I spent some time as a minister and then also as a newspaper reporter. You heard that listing a little while ago. In those professions, when you're somewhere for three years, you're the old man. And so uh, to be here 24 years is just kind of weird, but I've seen a lot of things come and go over those years. Um, as, as Sarah said, I'm always interested in communication and connection and human connection. and I, I have a theory that it may be something similar to what I suspect of my colleagues who teach psychology. Do we have any psychology folks in here today? Okay, psychology major maybe, but not. Okay, so the psychology faculty aren't, aren't here. Um, for communication folks, you see, it can be like this. You're awkward at communicating. So while you're in college, you take a class in communication, you think it's going to make you better. It sort of does, but not completely. So you take another class, and then you take another class, and you keep this up, and eventually they say, well, here's a degree in communications. I sometimes wonder if my psychology faculty aren't like that, too. I feel a little crazy, so I'll take a class in psychology, and, <laughs> you know. But I, I really do, all kidding aside, I relate to this. Most people these days have never really seen someone who is in an iron lung. You may have seen these in history classes or something like this. If you don't recognize them, they are devices to help people breathe. For the most part, folks who were victims of polio, 1940s, 1950s. There are still a few around. And back in the 1970s, I read about somebody named Paul Alexander who had polio when he was, I can't remember what age he was, but it was in the 1950s. One of the things that was different about Paul was that he wanted to be a lawyer, and the fact that he had polio was not going to change his plans. So he lived in an iron lung for a few years, but he was determined to go to law school, and this was in the 50s. It was well before the ADA. He determined he was going to get out of that iron lung, and there was a technique that they called frog breathing that I can't completely replicate, but as I understand it, it involves using your mouth and your cheek muscles to force air into your lungs, sort of a, a pulling it into your lungs, something like that, to inflate your lungs, and you exhale simply by stopping so that the natural weight of your body causes the exhalation. What this means is that every breath that he took outside of that lung was a conscious effort. Hard, yes, but the key here is conscious. Breathing is kind of unique among human beings. It's one of those things that happens automatically like beating your heart if you don't pay attention to it. But then on the other hand, you can affect it. You can hold your breath. You can take deeper breaths. You have much more control over it than you do things like kidney function, for example. Okay, so breath is right at that junction. Now, for me, here's the comparison that comes to mind. 
Paul, and this is not Paul, this is just a picture that I pulled off the internet, but Paul Alexander, out of that iron lung, took every breath consciously. If he fell asleep while he was in the classroom, he would die. Every breath conscious. When I was a kid, I was born with a slight degree of cerebral palsy. I'm very fortunate, I think, in a lot of ways regarding that. It was a slight degree, but it was enough to where I could not learn to ride a bicycle. My friends learned to ride bicycles, I don't know, what, what age do you usually learn to ride a bicycle? Six, seven, something like that. And my sons in the back, I was asking him, how do you, how do you learn to ride a bicycle? Because um, uh, his mom and I uh, divorced when he was young, and I don't think I was there when you were learning to ride the bike. I said, how'd you learn? He said, well, I fell a couple of times, but I just did it. The way people breathe, you know, you just do it. I did eventually learn to ride when I was 18 years old. It just kind of one day clicked. But that made me very aware of things that other people could do without having to really think about it too much. And that I had to think about consciously. There's... Another area that sometimes comes into play, and that is social skills. A lot of people are surprised to find I'm an introvert. Now, introversion and shyness are not the same thing. They can very often be related. All the world it means to say that you're an introvert, I just realized I do have a clicker up here somewhere, but I don't know what happened to it. Okay, so we'll just use the keyboard. Oh, there it is. The thing that makes an introvert an introvert is, number one, where do you get your energy? Extroverts form their energy by interacting with people. Introverts form their, or restore their energy by going by themselves somewhere. An introvert can enjoy a party just as much as anybody, but when they leave, they'll be exhausted. And that's me. An extrovert, and you know who you are, when you leave the party, you are more jazzed up than when you went in there. The other thing that distinguishes them, and this is what comes into the speech classes that I teach more commonly, introverts want to form their thoughts before they speak. You'd be surprised at the number of professional speakers who are introverts. Honestly, I'm much more comfortable doing this than I was just before this when I was out there making unplanned conversation. Extroverts form their thoughts by talking. And again, you know who you are <laughs> as you look at each other. My, my son, whom I mentioned a moment ago, as far as I can tell, screaming extrovert. Would you, would you describe yourself that way? And Yeah, he's not talking so much right now. But as, as he's getting older, he is coming to value those, those solitary times a little bit more. But he, he's an extrovert. There's nothing wrong or right with either one of them, just different. Shyness is a different thing that is a concern about how people view you so you can be a shy extrovert which can be kind of tough you know because you need to be around people to recharge and yet you're afraid of judgment you can see how that could be a bit of a problem lately though i've been wondering whether it's really introversion that's going on with me something that I've known about myself uh, for years is that just like Paul Alexander had to consciously take every breath and just like I had to learn to ride a bicycle in a much more conscious way than the average person does I'm the same way with social skills it seems like to me that everybody else does things naturally that I have to consciously think about every move I've often wondered if that same thing that was the, the little bit of cerebral palsy, because that's, I know right brain, left brain doesn't really apply to everybody, but there's a uh, somewhat of a statistical connection there. So the same side of your brain that controls the left side, that was where I was most affected, is supposedly where your emotions and social skills are. There are three people on earth who really know what my social skill concerns are. One of them is my wife, who's all, also in the back. The other, one of my best friends that I've known for years, Anita Maddox, 
And one way that I know that I can trust Mark Fuentes is because last year I talked with him about this, and he's never told anybody. I don't think. <laughs> And so it may be, you see, as I'm saying this to you, that some of you who know me for a while, you're going, I never would have thought that. You know, that, that every social interaction for me involves conscious decisions, conscious steps. And maybe it's not that I'm an introvert. Maybe it's just that it's exhausting the same way that breathing was exhausting for Paul Alexander. That may surprise some of you. But then on the other hand, some of you may be going, well, duh. You know, we could tell you were awkward. It's like Donald Trump suddenly announcing that his hair is not natural. <laughs> Everybody knows it, you see. And so, so I've never really known whether people were just being nice to me, patronizing, whether I actually had developed some social skills. I can't tell. Okay? So this is kind of the context in which I started thinking about all of this stuff about solitude and connection. It has changed in the digital age. Again, I don't think that's a surprise to anybody. But it's really easy for us to just kind of vilify these electronic devices that we all carry around. We might see things like this in the hallway where everybody's on their device and there is somebody who's sitting there wondering if anybody's going to talk to them. But for the most part, everybody's just on their device. It's one of the the advantages I have being here for 24 years, I've seen things change in our hallways. When I first started teaching here between classes, the hallways were a cacophony of conversation. People connecting with their friends, people talking. That seldom happens when you walk down that hallway, the third floor of uh, the McCorder building now, right? There are people talking, but for the most part, everybody's on their device. This is one that I came across on Facebook. This is your zombie apocalypse. <laughs> and one that's a little sadder, visiting grandma. You see grandma right here? And everybody's on their device. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's a very common experience these days. You go to a restaurant, you see people sitting at tables on their devices instead of talking to each other. Most of the stuff that I try to study is, is stuff that has something to do with me. I catch myself doing this. We just don't connect the way that we used to. Of course, it doesn't mean that it's all problematic. There certainly are useful things in terms of connection, but we can find ourselves feeling isolated even while we are surrounded by people. And so as I look at this whole thing of the dance of solitude and connection in the digital age, I can see four areas for us to think about as we make choices about how we are going to connect, because more and more these days, it is a matter of choice. See, here's, here's some of what's in my mind. Because of that lack of social skills thing I was talking about, I miss things. Now, everybody does. I just feel like, I think, that I do it more often. Yesterday afternoon, I was talking with Betsy Boyd, longtime friend over at the Blount County campus, uh, when, when I, I came to her with an idea, so I was on a mission, I was focused, and she was talking with somebody else about uh, cats and about the difficulty of making a decision about when to let go of a beloved pet. And I listened politely, but then I went into my mission. And I talked with her in her office for a while, and then she said, well, I've really got to go. I've got to get to the vet's office. Uh, I've got to pick up some medicine, all that kind of thing. I said, I understand. Good luck at the vet's. And I left. It didn't occur to me until an hour later. And I bet you got it immediately, didn't you? What's going on in Betsy's life? I can't believe I missed that. I see more and more of that kind of thing happening. For me, I think it may be biological. For a lot of people, it's because of us not developing the social skills. 
came across a statistic that fascinates me, and as I thought about it, I can't verify it, but I know it must be true, and it is this. You meet more strangers in a week than my grandfather met in a lifetime. Now think about that for a moment. My, my grandfather grew up in a small town in West Tennessee. He was born there, married somebody from there, lived there his whole life, owned a business there, went to church there. The, the town had a population of 900. Everybody knew everybody. And I don't think they thought in terms of social skills. It wasn't something that you just had to learn. It, it was something that was like water to a fish. I meet more strangers in a week than he did in a lifetime. People don't have a background with me. That affects a, a lot of other things. It, it, uh, I've been thinking about this here lately, I guess somewhat in a bit of a morbid way. Uh, people who retire and we never see them again. People who have passed on. Uh, people that I would consider to be good friends. And yet I realize how long has it been since I talked to them? Simply because we're no longer in this same place, you see. Something that really struck me the last couple of days about how disconnected I have gotten. My, my dad had three sisters. One died a long time ago. One died about 15, 20 years ago, which is a long time. But, but there was the one baby sister that was left, and we had stayed in touch. Except that I found out two days ago that she died two years ago. And I didn't know it. Nobody called me. But then on the other hand, I didn't call either. And so I got to poking around in the family and found out that a cousin of mine, two years younger than me, died a year ago. Now, that's sad on a lot of levels, but it says to me something about how disconnected I have become, we have become from each other. On the other hand, by the way, one of my favorite movies is uh, Fiddler on the Roof. Remember Tevia? And on the other hand, there's always another hand. Families are scattered all over the country, all over the world. And our relationships, in a lot of ways, have become simply shallow. I guess, in a way, I'm making fun of these folks that we're going to take a look at here. But, oh, that's what the Internet is for, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, look, look at the one on the right. Get, Do you have on, to let me make get the sound face? Turned up. I turned the volume down when we were listening to the music to begin with. And uh, somebody told me that if it's too loud, you're too old. Well, I have figured out I'm too old. <laughs> Let's back it up here again. <laughs> I mean, look, look at the one on the right. Do you have to Which, make faces when you take selfies? Wait, one more now. Oh, there you go. Oh, nice yeah. Better angle. Oh, check it. Did that come out okay? That's the best one of the 300 pictures I've taken look, of myself like, today. Every girl in the picture is locked into her phone. <laughs> oh, hold on. I'd take a selfie with the hot dog. Selfie with the churro. Selfie just of a selfie. Here's my first bite of the churro. Here's my second bite of the churro. You know, the beauty of baseball is you can sit next to your neighbor and have a conversation. Or you can just completely ignore them. Can you relate? I, I No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's not, it's not just a generational thing, okay? It'd be easy to put it down to that. But as a matter of fact, i uh, got, got a quote here from, uh, let me see, this is from Sherry Turkle, who wrote a book called Alone Together. In an interview with the APA Monitor, she said, the most dramatic change is our ability to be elsewhere at any point in time to sidestep what is difficult what is hard in a personal interaction and go to another place where it does not have to be dealt with. So it can be as simple as what happens when 15-year-olds gather for a birthday party. As anyone who has ever been 15 knows, there is a moment at such events when everyone wants to leave. And I can remember that, but we didn't have cell phones back then. When I was a boy. 
things get awkward. It is, however, very important that everyone stay and learn to get along with each other. These days, however, when this difficult moment comes, each 15-year-old simply retreats onto Facebook. Now, I know Facebook's kind of old-fashioned at this point, but you, you get the point. Okay. Whether or not they physically leave the birthday party, they have left. When teens tell me that they'd rather text than talk, they are expressing another aspect of the new psychological affordances of the new technology, the possibility of our hiding from each other. They say a phone call reveals too much, that actual conversations don't give them enough control over what they want to say. I think there's a pretty good insight into that. I would tweak it just a little bit, not so much, not enough control over what they want to say, but how they wish to be seen. It makes it a whole lot easier for us to put on our masks. One last quote from Turkle. It's a great psychological truth that if we don't teach our children how to be alone, they will always be lonely. There's a difference, isn't there? There's a difference between being alone and being lonely. This is one of those things I feel like I know gut level, folks, and I can't prove it, but I really feel like that the increase in such things as we have seen as school shootings and that sort of thing come from people being disconnected and not knowing how to connect. It's one of the, the passions that drive me as I teach communication courses, trying to give people those skills. Blaise Pascal in 1670, the point here being that this is not a new problem. In 1670, he said all of humanity's problems stem from an inability to sit quietly in a room alone. Well before cell phones and even much television, when I'm, here we are with another grandfather moment, when I was a boy, but it really was a television over there in the corner with only three channels. I can remember my mother turning on the air conditioner when it wasn't particularly hot. And I asked her, so why do you keep the air conditioner running all the time? She said, well, when it gets quiet, I get to thinking. And when I get to thinking, I get depressed. So I keep some noise going all the time. Television can be that way for us, can it not? Here's something else from my speech classes that I, I've noticed. Every once in a while, I don't do it as much as I used to because it has become a little more irritating to students. I will have them sit still quietly, simply listening to their breathing for 60 seconds. Some of them say it's the longest 60 seconds they have ever spent. And while we can chuckle about that, when was the last time that we simply sat quietly for 60 seconds? You have to sit for a little while. Don't you go for the device? Don't you pick up the book? Don't you pick up the magazine? I've been spending time here recently in dentists and doctors' offices, so I've been watching other people in the room. You don't see people who can sit still for longer than about 15 seconds. They've got to do something. We have to distract ourselves. So this insight from Blaise Pascal, nothing new, and yet it is certainly something that affects us. And here's, again, one of my concerns. From my point of view, I think many of the isms that we have in our culture today, whether it's sexism or racism or whatever ism you want to put out there, is a form of xenophobia, that is, fear of the outsider. People who are different from ourselves. People that we can somehow view as not being human. I think maybe I'm going to work that story in, Mark. I was talking to Mark uh, before about something that I had read in a book some years ago. I wish I could give credit. I can't remember where I read it. It's casual reading. But it, it was a, a woman in a book talking about going into a grocery store. She felt like she wasn't getting good service from the person, the clerk that was working the cash register. Just kind of distant, a little rude, irritating enough that she went and complained to the manager of the store. And he said, I'm sorry, I'll speak to her, I'll say something to her. This is her first day back at work. 
She's been out for three weeks because her husband just died after a long uh, illness, after a long bout with cancer. The author of the book said, oh, I'm sorry I didn't know. Don't say anything to her. It's okay. The point of this in the book was not to excuse bad service, but rather she was asking, why is it that we tend to jump to the conclusion if somebody's a little distant with us or, or whatever, we tend to jump to the conclusion, well, they don't care. Um, they don't care about their job. They're, they're, they're lazy, whatever it is. Why do we not simply assume that there must be a problem going on? I think what it lies, uh, what it comes down to is we're not connected to each other. When we are connected to people, they're no longer just roles. I, I do better with my students in terms of teaching when I connect with them outside of just being a teacher or a student. I think they learn more. I think they remember more. It's certainly a much more pleasant experience. But when we look at somebody in a role, faculty versus administrator, student versus teacher, citizen versus cop, we don't have that connection. So connection is very important. But we find ourselves now watching Shia LaBeouf, watching Shia LaBeouf. Am I saying his name right? Okay. If you don't know what this is about, um, apparently, and just out of curiosity, I'm going to take a chance here and hop over to browser. Um, Janet, I have forgotten the name of that website. What is it? Thank you. U hive slash all my movies, right? And you take a chance with technology here. You know, oh, website's not available. Did I not type it right? New, oh, newhive.com. How could I forget dot com? Dot. Could do it, yeah. See what I mean about taking a chance? One of the things about not having any social skills is I'm used to feeling foolish. Let's just do, because she found it by doing Shia LaBeouf movies. And NBC News, Wired, there it is. I still don't know what I did different. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Managed to conquer it. For whatever it's worth, uh, those of you who don't know me, I also work with the mobile fellows. And, um, yeah, yeah. And um, people will sometimes view me as an advocate for technology. I'm not an advocate for technology. I just refuse to let it win. You know, it's that kind of thing. So, um I, I really wasn't too familiar with his work. This is a live feed right now. Okay, Shia LaBeouf started, um, how many days ago, those of you who know about this? It's been like uh, two days, two days ago. He is watching all of his movies, and he invited people to come to the theater with him. So these people you can kind of see around him. Um, I, don't, I have no idea what he's watching right now. But is there anything weird about the fact that we are watching Shia LaBeouf, watching Shia LaBeouf? And this is happening right now. I've got a little bit of net congestion right there. Have no idea how many people are watching at the same time. I grabbed those screenshots just in case we couldn't get on here. But um, I'm still trying to figure out exactly what this says but it is certainly different from anything that my grandfather or my father, or let's face it, me, up until recently, could manage to figure out. I'm not sure why we have apps like this. <laughs> Folks, this is a social app. If you can't read it up there, places I've pooped. Here's, here's the thing. <laughs> 
as I look at the screenshots down here, drop a pin and mark your territory. Uh, receive notifications when your friends drop a pin. I mean, <laughs> yes, this is what passes for social media now. It's, it's a kind of mask. When advertising for this session went out, one of the things I heard back from Ron Bridges, because what was said in there, and I can't remember exactly, uh, Sarah, you, I think you sent the email out. It was something about um, not retreating in a cave. Do you remember that email? You guys remember seeing that one? Okay, okay Katie's the one who sent that. So you know, something about... Uh, uh, connected with each other, not retreating in a cave. And then I got an email from Ron Bridges who said, what's wrong with retreating into a cave? Because, see, we've got... I think my battery just died. When you decide to go into a cave, it's different. And this was tongue-in-cheek, but this is actually borne out by the research. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, let's see where we go next. See, this was a place that we decided to retreat to at one point. One of my best memories of the last few years was when uh, Janet surprised me with a weekend at this place that is called River Place on the Clinch. It's up in Kyle's Ford. Their advertising on their webpage included no cell phone service, no internet. I mean, that was their selling point. And when we went up there on Friday, we knew there was a phone, just a wired phone, one that goes into the wall, just in case of an emergency, which always matters. Uh, again, those of you who don't know me very well, I have a severely disabled daughter, so when we're away from home, we've got to be able to be reached. I keep my cell phone on all the time. It's on right now, just in case something goes on with her so it was a little nervy to be off of the grid for that weekend but it was so wonderful I have to admit on Sunday just as soon as we left there our, I started looking at my phone to see when I was going to get a signal back 222 emails <laughs> you know so there's, there's concerns on both sides, but still, uh, I was also talking with Terry Hansen about when they took a trip to Canada, and when they crossed the border, lost their signal, and how nervous that made him. There is a difference between when you're forced into it and when you make a decision to retreat. And those insights come to bear for us. It's very rare for anyone to spend any significant amount of time in quiet, we distract ourselves constantly, as we said a moment ago. Reed Larson, who is a professor of human development at the University of Illinois, found that though adolescents were not necessarily happier being alone, of course, when are they? Um, on average, the kids in his sample felt better after they spent some time alone than they did before. He found that kids who spent between, and to me, this is a significant figure, Kids who spent between 25 and 45 percent of their non-class time alone tended to have more positive emotions over the course of the week-long study than their more socially active peers. They were more successful in school, and they were less likely to self-report depression. Here's a quote from him. The paradox was that being alone was not a particularly happy state but there seemed to be kind of a rebound effect. It's kind of like a bitter medicine. In an age when no one is ever more than a text message or an email away from other people, the distinction between alone and together has become hopelessly blurry. Even as potential benefits of true solitude are starting to become clearer. Now, that was an interesting putting together for me. His study is showing that chosen times of solitude have distinct benefits. 
at the very moment when our studies are showing that we benefit from solitude, consciously chosen, hardly anybody chooses it anymore. It is, of course, something that is within our power. So we'll just use this as a, a um, holding place here for a moment. You see, there is loneliness and there's alone. They're not the same thing. There is solitude and there is isolation. They're not the same thing. In fact, many of the people that we've seen involved in violent confrontations in the last few months were surrounded by people. They were still isolated. It's not what happens to you, but what you think about what happens to you that determines your experience. That's one of my favorite quotes from an old dead Greek guy, Epictetus, said that over 2,000 years ago. It's not what happens to you, but what you think about what happens to you that determines your experience. I think we see that coming into play here. Now, let's look on the other hand yet again, and that is at forming connection through electronic and social media. If, in fact, our families are scattered all over the world, if, in fact, we tend not to have those natural kind of interactions that my grandfather had where you don't really have to think about social skills, you just do it, like hopping on the bicycle and pedaling off. What we do have now in a conscious sort of way is the ability to choose our tribes. Who are we going to be connected to? My other son, when he was young, uh, we were worried about him kind of being like me, actually, you know, with the social skills kind of thing, being a little disconnected and all that kind of thing. For him, I really think that part of what brought him out was something that a lot of people worry about getting in the way of social skills. World of Warcraft. Not the popular game that it used to be, still plenty popular, several million people playing it. Um, he got in on it when it was just out of beta. And for those of you who play this kind of stuff, I don't know how many level 90, or is it up to 95 now? Not sure. How many level, it's at least 90. He's got several level 90 characters. I watched him take a brand new character to level 90 in two and a half days. I mean, he knows how to play it. But the thing that I mentioned about it here is that he learned something that in a lot of ways is more valuable than the stuff that you learn in school. He learned how to fail and to learn from it and to come back from it. So if you haven't played these games, and, and I, I have to say for credibility, I've got three level 90 characters. I, I learned to play World of Warcraft sitting in the hospital uh, as, as my daughter slept. It was something to keep me awake when I couldn't concentrate well enough to read. So I learned to play it too, but I didn't learn to play it the way that Zach did. What you do in these things is you team up with a group of people, you tackle a boss, and almost inevitably the first time you do that, you're going to die. And people say, well, that's not real life. You can't come back from dying. Yeah, but you can come back from getting fired. You can come back from any number of other failures in life. And what they would do would be to take a step back and say, well, that didn't work. What can we try next time? What can we learn from our experience? Let's try it again. And they'd die again. But eventually, they would take it down. So he learned how to set goals that were stretch goals, how to put up with the frustration, which, honestly, I've never been good at. I've never really taken challenges in World of Warcraft. I've taken the easy routes. He learned how to face those. He learned how to work with other people in order to accomplish a goal like that. And I noticed that as he developed greater skills in World of Warcraft, he also developed greater skills at dealing with people out here. This, this stuff sometimes, yes, it can be used to distance us from real life, but it can also give us the skills for real life. Here's another one. Most of us are familiar with Facebook at this point, even though it's kind of, as I said a little while ago, outdated for a lot of folks in college now. I have reconnected with friends that I haven't seen in 30 or 40 years. 
they have been a real support to me as I have faced and as we have faced things in our family, uh, our daughter's health and other stuff, real source of support. There are things that I learn about people that I work with every day that I wouldn't normally know about because it just doesn't come up when you're talking about job stuff, right? So Facebook is one of those things that can connect, connect people. It also enables you to form communities in another way. Um, see if our little, yeah, the batteries, there it is. You see that label right there? It happened that when I did that screenshot, that's one of my communities, Whovians, people who love Dr. Who. Okay, we form all kinds of communities out there. Now, potential downside to that, I'm not going to take the time to go to it, but there's a website I'd like to show my, my students. It's called theflatearthsociety.org. These people believe that the earth is flat. They're serious about it. It's not a spoof site. There have always been crackpots in the world. The Internet makes it easier for them to find each other and organize. So there's that aspect to it, but the truth is, if, if I, when, when I was growing up, if I was a Whovian, very likely there wouldn't have been anybody else in town who was. It'd be hard to find those folks. The Internet lets us find each other, right? New communities there. That's a positive thing. And going back a few years, Janet, does this screen look familiar? My wife and I met online. It was in the early days. It was, it was before the Internet. Okay, you guys, how many of you remember CompuServe? What were some? Three of you. <laughs> it's still there. AOL, you remember America Online? Okay, these, these kind of silo communities that were out there. Well, Genie was one of those. At one time, Genie was the number two uh, online. I can't even think what you called it. It's not an online community, but... Anyway, they were number two, and so that's where my wife and I met. We met in a family roundtable, people who were interested in learning stuff about raising kids. When we met, it was through text only. And we have commented before that if we had met each other in person first, the way that people have done for thousands of years, we may have not been at all interested in each other because you got all those preconceived notions, right? We got to know each other before we ever laid eyes on each other. Some years ago, I was asked to perform a wedding for a couple who met on this same place, on Jeannie. Uh, he was from New Hampshire, and she was from Colorado, or vice versa. So they decided to get married in North Carolina, somewhere in the middle, asked me to conduct the wedding. I don't think it was planned this way, but when I got there, we realized that there were, there were 80 of their friends that were attending from all over the country, Every, every couple there was somebody who had met online. And it was the same kind of story. We got to know each other before the preconceived notions ever came into it. So connection, disconnection. We can connect through social and electronic media, or it can disconnect us. Depends on what we do with it. We can connect through communities. Consciously connecting face-to-face -face or online, I'm starting to think that it really doesn't matter whether it's electronic or not. What matters is the fact that today, because of the mobility of our society, our culture, if we don't consciously take steps, we won't connect. But on the other hand, we have the ability to make those choices to choose to connect. So here's what it comes down to for me as a bottom line sort of thing. I want to urge you to plan for solitude. You may have to start lightly to begin with. 60 seconds of simply sitting and listening to your breathing. Some of you who are experienced with this kind of thing will say, well, that sounds like meditation. It can be, but I'm not even talking about that. I'm just simply talking about getting comfortable with being with yourself. It's an old tradition in a lot of cultures, something like a Sabbath day, a day off. Turn these things off every once in a while. Now, don't throw them away, but turn them off. 
one of my uh, colleagues and friends over at Blount County, Casey Lambert, does not have the internet at home. And I haven't honestly asked her if that is just because it's not available where she lives, but I think it's a conscious choice. And I think it has something to do with why uh, Casey's a much calmer person than a lot of us around that office. Uh, Angela, you know her, you know, would you agree with that? Yeah. Uh, I think she's made a conscious choice that I'm just not going to have it at home. I'll use it for work. But it's not going to be there at home. For a lot of people these days, that sounds pretty extreme. And I'll be honest with you, I wouldn't want to do without it. But I do need to be turning it off more often. And this is coming from a guy who works with the mobile technology. And the reason is not because the technology is evil. It's because then when we come to the technology, we can use it more effectively. I want to urge you to be conscious of when you choose to spend a certain amount of time alone. And here's another report from a study. This study says that when we spend a certain amount of time alone, it can make us less closed off from other people, more capable of empathy. In other words, better social animals. This is a quote from John, and I don't know exactly how to say his last name, Cassiopo, University of Chicago. He says, people make this error thinking that being alone means being lonely. And not being alone means being with other people. You need to be able to recharge on your own sometimes. Part of being able to connect is being able, or excuse me, is being available to other people. And no one can do that without a break. The reason I chose the title, The Dance of Solitude and Connection, twofold, I guess. One reason is, uh, sort of like Sir Ken Robinson, I can't dance. Okay, I, I, I grew up in a religious group that... Um, uh, the, the joke among us was you don't have sex standing up because it might lead to dancing, okay? And so I just, I never learned, and therefore it kind of fascinates me. But the other reason is because a dance, as opposed to a race or a journey, it doesn't have a goal. You know, you're not trying to get to the end of the dance, right? Otherwise, we just play the music faster and dance faster, and we get it over with faster. The dance is its own reason and so it is with solitude and connection so I leave you with this if you feel isolated take a step connect it's not going to happen by itself you may have to breathe consciously so to speak for a little while and if you are connected then celebrate that connection. Take it deeper. Because just like the dance, it's the thing that makes life, life. I appreciate you connecting with me this afternoon, spending a little time together. I hope that it has been worth your time. Thank you very much.